Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast with Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. During this program, you will hear interviews with real-life successful investors who will share their stories and provide useful advice on how to acquire, finance, and operate apartment complexes. Now, here they are, Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Peebles, National Underwriter for Old Capital, and joining me today, the man himself, Mr. Michael Becker. Hey, Paul. How are you, Michael? Things are going well. How are you? Tell me a little bit about what's going on with the SPI group. Oh, we're just busy. Got a couple of deals tied up, so we're trying to put it all together and uh, hopefully go out and raise $24 million bucks here shortly. So uh, it's been uh, been a little all-consuming the last few months, so kind of breaking, about to break our streak, so excited about that. I bet you're excited that, you know, Michael Becker, who has bought over 7,000 apartment units and manages lots and lots of deals for a happy investor. So we're, we're glad to hear that that log jam has uh, been pulled down. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully not. No one jinxed myself. So I'm uh, not counting our chickens yet, but, uh, getting close. That's good. One thing I want to make sure we remind everybody to do. If you think you have value or see value within the old capital podcast, do, do me a favor, do us a favor. Go back into iTunes and give us a five-star rating. We would definitely appreciate that. Any words of wisdom that you want to add into the two, we would definitely appreciate You know, some kind words. Also, too, don't forget, 17-page white paper report on the old capital. Again, 2019 multifamily financing white paper 101. Download that. Go to the oldcapitalpodcast.com, oldcapitalpodcast.com. Download the white paper report, something that Michael, James, and myself put together just to kind of give you a heads up about what it takes to finance large apartment buildings. It's a lot different from, from single family. Our guest today will kind of t- maybe talk a little bit about that, the difference between single family and multifamily or even construction stuff. But go into the Old Capital Podcast and download that white paper report. We'd love to, to share that information with you. So in the podcast today, we have one of our friends that we've done a couple transactions for, and uh, he's kind of going to tell us a little bit about his journey from being – kind of an analyst, kind of a numbers guy, then getting into some new construction, some ground up new construction, you know, small stuff, but the ground up new construction, and then transitioning over to multifamily. So in the podcast today, we have Tahid Siddique. Tahid, nice to see you. Thanks for coming in. Sure. Thank you very much. Good to be here with uh, you, Paul, and thank you, from uh, Michael. No problem. So I want to kind of you know, drill down right from the beginning a little bit about your background. Where do you come from? How many years have you been in Texas? And tell us a little bit about you. Sure. So my background, going back to educational background, I have two bachelor's degrees, one in mathematics, one in computer science. That kind of prepared me well, you know, in terms of the analytical skills. And then I have an MBA in finance uh, that I did about almost, I guess now, 20 years ago. So uh, that's my educational background. And right after MBA, I worked for Wall Street uh, I have been involved since 90s in the money management business, and uh, it was really back in 2005 that I said goodbye to Wall Street, and it was really traveling all the time. What were you doing for Wall Street? So I was in um, you know, a couple of things. First, I joined Daiwa, which was at the time the third largest Japanese bank, and then I worked for uh, Bank Julius Baer, which is the largest private bank, and I was on the alloc- asset allocation and fund of fund sides. At Julius Bear, we managed close to about 900 million. Then I went on my own with another friend and we created a group called AltVantage. And there I managed fund of funds. We had internal hedge funds and we had external hedge funds from like 2000 all the way to 2005. I did that. And then from 2005 onwards, you know, I left Wall Street. And in 2006, I started joining a full time real estate. I moved to uh, Texas. You asked how long and that's been 2013. As soon as I moved here in 2013, I started actually um, constructing multifamily buildings, and I also joined actually Brad Summerock back in 2013. So I have been in Texas uh, since 2013. So tell me a little bit about the reason why you decided to get out of, of Wall Street and then join real estate and having real estate being your chosen profession. Sure. That's a great question, to be honest. I'll tell you, I love Wall Street, and if I have to do it all over again, I would do the same thing. I loved everything about it, you know, getting up in the morning, working hard, dealing with the uncertainty every day and challenges. I loved it, but I literally was traveling a lot. I was sometime in three continents in like five days. And after a while, it got to me. I was I was living in New York. I made day trip to uh, San Fran all the time. Even you can call it a day and a half trip to Switzerland. 
I was doing that sometimes, literally like three times a month, where I would take six o'clock flight, land uh, Zurich, change at the airport, go do the presentation, have, you can call it lunch, I guess, and then head back to the airport, take a flight back, go home and be back at work. What did your family think about that? Well, that was the thing. I, ha- I had twins at the time, three-year-old, and it wasn't going very well with my wife. I, I was doing great. To be honest with you, you know, and again, like I said, I loved it every moment of it. But after a while, uh, traveling got to me. And frankly, I did pretty well. And I decided to do something on my own. And it was the lack of uncertainty in real estate, lack of the volatility that both things that were bothering me at Wall Street. And here, obviously, it is more visibility. And everybody asks me, how do you compare? And this is how I compare. Wall Street to me is advanced calculus. Real estate to me is not even algebra. It's arithmetic. It's, It's pretty simple. You know, and I don't mean to oversupply. Why, Obviously, why, why there are cycles. That? Why is it so simple to you? So there are cycles, but I think there's more visibility. You you can calculate your risk. And let me give you an example. Even in, uh, right before 9-11, we launched a portfolio and uh, just had invested, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars right before it. And then 9-11 happened. And market was closed for like seven days. No, We, we didn't know how much down we are going to be. And I was getting calls from European and Far East investors every day. But you don't know. So think things can happen, you know, that are out of your control. And Wall Street also, sometimes you're invested in uh, in global equities and something happens that you have absolutely no control over. You can wake up in the morning and you could be down 10%. And that is what, you know, in real estate you can avoid and you have more control. You have more control over hedging as well. You can match your asset liabilities. What I mean by that, and we can talk in more detail, is get the right loan and use the right term uh, of the loan for your assets and you, you'll do okay. That is not to say that there are no down cycles in real estate, but I think you can protect yourself better. You have tools available. You have more visibility. You can do better. And so, maybe so I'm older front, now than I was when I was in 30s, and now I can't afford being down 20% in a day. Yeah, being in front of a computer is so difficult for people's lives these days to stay in front of their portfolio. I mean, you're right. The portfolio could go down you know, 10%, 20% in a blink of an eye. Overnight in Zurich, something may happen, may affect the United States. And if you're out doing your life and you're, you're not paying attention to it, it, it can have a detrimental effect of what, what you're doing, especially with having people have so much money in, in mutual funds. I mean, you cannot trade out of those mutual funds automatically. You can sell your position in the deal, but you know, you're really with the market. I can definitely see the stress that people get when they have so much of their money in the market itself and not in real estate because real estate's not going to go down 10, 20% in a day. Exactly. And also speaking of mutual funds, by the way, here's a stat that most mutual fund managers won't tell you. More than 80% of the mutual funds underperform the market. What does that mean? So you can put your money in S&P index over long term and you'll do better than 80% of the mutual funds. Not a good stat for active managers. No. So let's go back into your transition. So you went from a Wall Street guy and decided to go into real estate. Again, how did you start off? I mean, you had a single family home. How did you start getting into development of some small multifamily properties? So I was actually, even when I was in Wall Street towards the end, right, I had already, I wanted to have more stable income on the side. So I had already looking at, you know, maybe contemplated like investing in in strip malls. I had already thinking about, you know, apartments, duplexes. I had already started working on it. And also remember, even at Wall Street, you know, we invested in REITs, which is real estate investment trust. And also I was investing um, uh, institutional capital in the mortgage-backed securities. So I was very familiar with the real estate market, but I had not had a firsthand experience of building and construction. And that's, uh, I, I kind of, you know, went in and took on a smaller project on my own. Well, I guess in the hindsight, it was not a very small project, but at the time, yeah, you know, I just want to do something and I'm kind of person, if I want to do something, I find the right people how, and I just go about doing were, it. How many units was it the first one? Like As a matter of fact, the first one was a duplex. But then, you know, fast forward that to like 2013 here in Texas. You know, I came here and um, I still had a Wall Street mentality. I looked at your real estate here and I'm, you know, I just came from New York where real estate cycles are quite long and honestly quite favorable and maybe even more correlated with stock market. No matter what, you know, New York's economy always will have some impact how, how your stock market is doing. But when I moved here in, in Texas back in 2013, honestly, I looked at your multifamily here and I at the time felt that maybe post 2008, you know, things have started going up and maybe it had gone 
too fast and there might be a blip. So I decided again to go and build. And my idea was, and one of the things, you know, if you talk to me, you will always hear is downside protection. And maybe part of that is again, you know, working Wall Street, that's grilled into me. So that downside protection and cyclicality kind of made me decide to go into the construction or continue the construction here. My idea was that if I can make, you know, 15 to 25% spread on my construction, two things. One, I will have a portfolio of brand new construction of properties of my own. And two, if God forbid, you know, market hits me, I will have that cushion, right? But obviously, in the hindsight, we all know since 2013, market here has been, you know, fantastic. So that's how I started in 2013. And since then, I've been building. And as you know, second part of my business is buying stabilized uh, class B and class C assets. So on both sides of the business, last five years have been phenomenal. So what was your idea when you developed those projects and do the ground up construction? Were you going to sell them? Was it like a merchant build strategy or were you going to then convert them into to rentals and, and own them for a longer period of time? So Mike, that's a good question. Again, you know, the real me, me is very conservative or timid, you can say, and I look for a downside protection. So what I've done is I've done both. I have built and sold, and that is to create cash flow, but I have built and kept the portfolio for myself as well. And the reason was, you know, I, I built and pre-sold, okay? Again, I, I just wanted downside protection, and I wanted to have a guarantee on the back end that when I build, even if the economy turns, I have it sold, and that's what I've done in the past five years. So let's make that transition. You had gotten into multifamily. You had done ground-up construction. I think your last ground-up construction you did, was it eight doors or 16 doors? How many? So the last uh, ground-up construction I've done is actually 32-unit apartment complex in uh, in Princeton. And how difficult was that to do? I mean, you, you didn't have a lot of experience, but how was it with the city city people? How was it with the lending? How did you do it? So I'm, I'm to be honest with you, Paul, I'm a big believer in building the right team. Before I started that project, I had already built a number of duplexes, more than 20 probably in Princeton and wow. McKinney. So I already had a team of uh, engineers. I already had a team of architect and subcontractors. Frankly, it was not as hard as you would think. Yep. You know, it went pretty smooth. We bought the land. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, first day came on the market. I knew Princeton so well. Second day, it was under contract. And right away, went to the city. As you all know, you know, it's always a long process of city back and forth. It took us nine months to get our plans approved, but we got it. And um, I tell you, every time now I pass those units, I absolutely love it. And I am going to repeat same kind of project very soon and again in North Dallas, except that this time is going to be probably five times bigger. Well, we put you on the spot here. That, you know, I hear a lot of positive stuff, but tell me some of the negative stuff that went, went on that project for people to understand maybe how to avoid it. Well, you get a lot of gray hair, that's for sure. <laughs> you know what, what you're what, dealing with. What, gray, what gave you the gray hair? <laughs> so as you know, there's a lot of development going on in DFW, right? So there, there's a uh, labor squeeze. The uh, raw material Cost. for construction went up a lot during my construction. So make sure you do your numbers right. Make sure you have the right team. You know, make sure you pay your team in time uh, so they can stick around to work for you. Otherwise, they have plenty of opportunities right now to work for somebody else. I am very proud to say that my core team that was with me five years ago still is with me. And now it's going to be same core team working with me in, in, in the next large project. So, you know, budget right. I can tell you, and this is where I was saying, you know, I'm very conservative. I pre-sold some of it and I gave up some of the profit because of that. But because of that, I was able to withstand the increase in the raw material and still able to price it and profit it very nicely. So budgeted right, have the right team, pay, and ready to work very hard. So you're still doing that to a certain extent of doing the, the small multifamily stuff. But now you made the transition a couple of years ago to the large multifamily of the class B minus C plus C properties in the DFW area. So let's kind of talk a little bit about that because your first project was 1920 up in Denton. And you did that in a, with a partnership. And, but I really want to kind of focus on your, maybe your second one, and that is Casa Feliz. Can we talk a little bit about Casa Feliz? Sure, absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about Casa Feliz. Casa Feliz Apartments is in Dallas, Texas. What year was that property built? It has five buildings. It is like uh, early 60s. Early 60s. So it has, you know, when you look at it, right, you know, it can scare a lot of investors. And how did you find it? 
How was the deal brought to you? It was again brought to me by a great friend, Nick Flewellen. Obviously, I've done a lot of business with him at this point. I've closed three deals with him, and he brought that deal to me. So, were you the first buyer that they had chosen in the deal, or how did that work? That's very interesting. It's 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 quite a long story. So, the best and final actually was in June last year, and I was among the top three that went in best and final. And I did not match the highest offer. I, I went as high as I could. And I can tell you, I, I many times I've let deals go because of my downside protection mentality. And I was given the offer to match a number that I was not comfortable with. And I let that deal go because of that, despite the fact that the seller knew that I have a certain need to close and I had the funds to close and I have the ability to manage this uh, project. But at the time, he decided to go with somebody who was going to offer him, you know, 150,000, 200 more than I was willing to do. And I let that deal go, as a matter of fact, in, in June. And then, you know, like many times it happens, two months later, I still remember I was walking into my office and uh, I got a text, do you want the deal? And I'm like, oh, okay, do I want the deal? Are we talking about Casa Feliz? Yes. And I said, yeah, I want it at my price that I gave you and they said it's yours. So that's how we got it. So between the first best and final, which was in June, and closing, that was in November, it took a long time. It was it was quite um, you know a lot of work in between. So June, July till November, to yeah. the time you actually you close the deal, that's longer than than typical in the transaction. What did you like about this deal? So let, let me mention something else. By the way, you know, from June till November, you know, I don't think we could have closed this honestly if it wasn't it wasn't for Old Capital's help. It was, as you know, in November, you know, all the uh, treasury markets were going crazy and uh, you did an amazing job. We had a lot of setbacks in terms of proceeds and this and that, but we worked through it and, you know, we all came with creative solutions and we ended up closing the deal. So thank you. What did I like about the deal? Again, like I said, you know, it's a, it's a deal that's early 60s construction. Many investors could, you know, justifiably so, it can scare them. But I can tell you, you know. Why, why is that? Well, let me tell you, it's $900,000 of rehab. Okay. It's a lot of work. How many doors right? is it? Uh, this is 160 doors. Okay. Right? So, you know, for 160 doors, 900000 is is not a small rehab. And uh, th- this is, these are obviously older buildings. But that is exactly what attracted me towards it. And I can tell you, when I ran the model, you know, I, I really wanted this deal. I thought it had a great potential. And I can tell you, so far, we haven't even started the rehab in the last five months, and we are doing better than our performa. So it sounds like the numbers I had are, are really working. We have to do interior rehab. We have to do exterior rehab. But the previous seller has done a lot of heavy lifting in terms of structural issues. We have to now you know, improve the curb appeal. We have to do the landscaping. We have to do the exterior repaint, may even uh, rebrand it, and then do some interior rehab. So it's, it's just a lot of work, and a lot of work is, I guess, what attracts me because, again, because of my construction background, I have access to engineers, I have access to architectures, I have access to interior designers, and I even have access to the contractors. And I can tell you, because of all this, every deal that I've been into, you know, I've always done rehab and IRL under budget. So what, why haven't you started the renovation? You said you're five months into it and you haven't, haven't done that yet. Was there a reason behind that? Yeah, part of it was we bought it, you know, uh, we closed it on November 8th, and then it was Thanksgiving, and then it was holidays, right? And then it was cold temperatures because we need to repaint. So right now, as we speak, we, we our rehab is in full, exterior rehab in full swing, and we are just now waiting for the designer to finalize the design, which should be in a couple of weeks. So I, frankly, you know, our deadline, obviously, as per the lender, is end of November, but I expect that by end of June or July, we should be all done. So this is a transaction that how many investors did you have to have besides you into the property? So this is, uh, although this is a syndication, this is 18 investors, including me. And this is mostly, you know, my close friends and acquaintances. And these are all actually uh, mostly uh, physicians. And again, how do you know these guys? I mean, do you walk up to a physician and say, what do you think about investing? Are these personal friends? Are these friends of friends? How do you find your circle of influence to get these people to invest money in a transaction that you have? Sure. 
So as a matter of fact, uh, one, you know, I was a partner in another deal, Tradewinds, b- yeah. back in 2017. Okay. And uh, one of them actually, because of me, he invested in, in, in that and he had done pretty good. And then he said, hey, I have, you know, a few friends. Uh, most of them I, I already know. And they said, but we want our own separate building. And they had some set parameters. You know, we want it in uh, DFW. We don't want to go out of DFW. So then we just all started talking more about it during dinners and hangouts over the weekends. And frankly, and you know, during golf rounds. And we decided that this is the range and we're going to buy in DFW. And frankly, it took actually more than 10, I think almost like 12 months to find exactly what we were looking for and to uh, hit the numbers, what we were looking for. And once we found it, obviously, we we're very happy that we so were you, able to buy it. Yeah, you led the team of investors. You were the managing member of the, of the partnership, and you had a couple other people that joined you in this transaction to sign on behalf of the partnership. And then you had a, a bunch of people that were just limited partners in this transaction. How does that conversation go? How do you start this conversation and I guess you already told me that you had a couple of people that you knew that were already in a previous syndication. But the new people, how do you get the new people to commit to you to put $100,000 in or $150,000 or even 50000 Do they have experience in multifamily? Do they know anything about uh, multifamily? How, how do you broach that subject with them? So part of it is, honestly, you know, you have to have a track record. You have to have your background, right, to – and again, Ask, a lot of people and, are going to say, I have no track record. I, are you talking about maybe your personal background that like you, you had a, a skills on Wall Street that were kind of transferable into a business that you gave them a high level of trust because of who you are, the way you carry yourself, the, the other transactions that you were into. So maybe if you became a, maybe a passive investor first, and then you had the ability to become your own lead. That you gave them enough confidence that they felt comfortable with you? It, it's, it's kind of all of the above, Paul. You know, in, in this case, like I said, one of them invested in one deal and he did very well. And then, you know, he had other friends who were my acquaintances and friends too. And they all said, you know, this is what we want to do. And they asked me because I was doing this already. They knew I was also doing quite successfully on the construction side. Right. And they know my background as well. This but is, as this far is your as nine to five job. Uh, this is all I do. Yeah. Uh, I don't have any other job. I don't have any you, any other business interest. You focus on this exclusively ten hours a day. What I what I heard Paul was a third party validation. Essentially, was uh, he was successful making having one investor invest in a deal, return some capital, then tells all his rich friends. That's basically the uh, the short <laughs> version. And instead of him having to go out and sell himself, a third party is going out and and speaking highly of him. So it's like a transfer of credibility instantly from, um, you know, if, if I invest with you and you return money, I tell my friends and they, they feel a little bit more comfortable coming out of the gate that, uh, that someone independently uh, verified that he did what he said he was going to do. He outperformed, he returned capital. And that's, you know, that's a good way of kind of getting into this business and expanding your database. Yeah. Did you build like a real estate resume besides your resume? Did you build a re- real estate resume that you could kind of hand these folks? Not only did you hand it to your banker to show prove up of what you've done in the past, but when you're out, soliciting for equity, can you show them or did you show them what you've done in the past? So in this case, like I said, you know, a number of them are in my social circle. So we just in general even talk about, you know, what are you up to? What are you doing? So they they know what I do all day. Yeah. Uh, right. So they knew how I was investing and, you know, doing you're, on you're the construction the, yeah, side. Yeah, you're the real estate guy in the group. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Although, uh, honestly, you know, some of them are quite active because they have obviously a lot of disposable income and, you know, they, they also want to invest on the side. But the fact is, even when they're doing projects somewhere else, they run that project by me first. Yeah. You know, many times they come and ask for my advice. Hey, somebody brought this to me. You know, what do you think? How many doctors in your circle want to be like you? They want to say goodbye to medicine and they want to get into real estate. You know, (laughs) I'm not sure they want to say goodbye to medicine, but it's funny. Uh, And even within doctors, right? There are different professionals because some are um, neurosurgeons, some are anesthesiologists. So, they do have a desire to be making money while not working, you know, and in, in, in their professional, I guess they know that they only make money when they're working. And that is something, by the way, I educate them too a lot that saying, look, you know, you really got to listen to Warren Buffett and people like that. You know, you got to have a second income, you got to have third income, but they're smart, obviously, you know, and they have the money. So 
they just need somebody who's reliable, who has a background, and they're willing to do projects with. So I'm not sure if they want to leave their jobs, but they all want to be in real estate. Definitely, they understand that this is a great way to make money and have passive cash flow. Tell me a little bit about you know, going back to this Casa Feliz, this older property that you guys, you guys purchased. I mean, this was a stabilized asset, and you put a Fannie Mae loan on the property. You got good leverage in the deal, and you have had to rehab the property. So when sometimes when you get a Fannie Mae loan, you get a bank loan, you get a, you know, what type of a bridge loan, they want you to do rehab and repairs to the property for health and safety reasons, to, you know, just to make sure that the property doesn't kick off a problem for the bank. And they'll give you kind of a schedule of things that they want you to fix, whether it's the roof or the, the playground you know, or the, the pool area. But you had a, an issue that they came back to you for the parking lot. Can you talk a little bit about the parking lot and, and what they said and what you were able to do it for? Yeah, that, that's very interesting. And again, you know, this is where your construction background helps. One of the items they gave me, they said it's going to cost you $89,000. Yeah, we knew that up front. It was $89,000. $89,000 for some pavement repair. Yeah. Okay. I went in and I looked at it and I said, no, There's no I don't way. think so. I don't think so. But obviously, you know, you can't talk to lender without substantiating what you want to say. So I called a couple of uh, contractors and I said, hey, what would you estimate? And- they said, is no it, way close. And is this before the loan closed or was this after the loan No, this closed? is after the loan closed. So if they said $89,000 or $90,000 of rehab on the parking lot, the lender is going to require you to do 125 to 150% to be held back to make sure that work gets done. So That's you, right. So you had to raise not just $90,000, but you had to raise hundred plus, $120,000 plus. And then the lender is holding on to that money, making sure that that work is complete. Finish your story. Right. So uh, again, it was $89,000, right? And I, I, I looked at it and I didn't agree with it. I said, you know what? Certain things you're asking probably don't need to be done. And this is not $89,000. I called two contractors. Again, you know, before I, I went back to lender, I want to make sure uh, what I'm saying I can substantiate. So two contractors came. And this is, by the way, again, this, this is a, you know, team sport. You got to have team around you who can come and help you. And in this case, two contractors came, and basically we came up with an expense of twenty five hundred dollars. Okay, so eighty nine thousand dollars versus twenty five hundred dollars. So of course, when I call lender, you can imagine what kind of conversation we had. Yep. Uh, no way, you know, this this can't happen. I'm like, well, look, you know, it is what it is, and you guys can come and look at it if you want. But I don't think it's going to cost more than twenty five hundred dollars. And, uh, and this again, is the same scope. Of work. Absolutely same scope of work. Okay. Absolutely same scope of work, except that some scope of work that they were asking was not required. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, it was a little different, right? So, but they said, you know, we're going to send uh, another inspector, different inspector, and you're going to pay for it. And I'm like, happily, happily do that. And the inspector came and um, guess what? Two days later, I got an email. The inspector agreed with me. So what we are going to do for eighty nine thousand dollars now we got it done for twenty five hundred dollars. Mike, where does that uh, eighty nine thousand dollar number come from? I mean, who's making that decision? Tell me a little bit more about an engineer with the, the PCA. Oh, so it's like a generalist that the uh, lender hires to do a property condition report, and so they know a little bit about everything, but not specifically uh, knowledgeable on any one construction component. It's kind of a generalist. So one of the things you might want to consider next time you come across that is during the process, you get the initial table back for immediate repairs as well as kind of the ongoing uh, replacement reserves. And anytime we see a number, we'll go out and try to get a a trade to bid it to then knock that number down uh, on the initial estimate. So since they give you an initial table of kind of immediate scope of our immediate repairs as well as the ongoing table, you can come in and try to argue back to the lender like, no, no, you're wrong. You know, this this is a three thousand dollar item, not a ninety thousand dollar item, and then that would have avoided the upfront kind of conversation if you could do some of that. Or if they say that, um, you know, I don't know, another example, maybe like some carpentry and paint oh. that you actually have a bid from a third party, you can come in and try to uh, try to get that, and maybe get it out of the immediate repairs, maybe put it into the capex items as well, because the immediate repairs, the lenders can, like you mentioned, Paul, make you uh, escrow about one hundred twenty five percent of it. 
or if it's like an improvement to the property, not an immediate, they don't make you, they only have to escrow a hundred percent of it. So those are some like little pro tips that we use along the way to try to knock that initial number down or even going through the table of the, um, ongoing replacement reserves. Cause you're going to look out 10 or 12 years out to kind of match maturity of the loan that not only is the property good today, but they know in five years from now, you got to resurface that same parking lot. You resurface today. It's going to wear out because the asphalt parking lot. So maybe you could try to move some of those dates around and try to get some justifications of the lender and to the, to the engineer to try to knock the ongoing monthly impound they take from you as well. How does that sound about right? Absolutely. Absolutely. But uh, again, you know, you got, you got to have a background to pick and figure out that, you know, scope may not be right or, you know, you can do it for less. Yeah. Right. Or you got to have the right contractor. If it makes sense. I mean, sometimes these engineers are spot on or actually even sometimes even a little low, but something like that where you had your background that you already had done some construction and then you were able to kind of size that up fairly quickly. Exactly. And, and look, most of the time I think they, they are pretty good, but here and there, there are opportunities and, you know, we can even talk about the other property soon. And like I said, on every deal that I've been in. I've always done IRL and rehab under budget. What's IRL? What does that mean? So that's an immediate repair list that I think Mike was just referring to as well. When you buy a deal, you have two types of budgets. One is the immediate repair list that is given by the lender, and then you have your own rehab budget, right? And on on IRL, like Mike was saying, if they gave you 500000 to spend on IRL, as a matter of fact, it's 25% more that they held from you, Yeah. right? So IRL has a bigger impact on your cash flow up front uh, until you get all that cash back, the extra cash they held back. You know, you have more money taken away from you than you're going to spend. And for you, that was a big, big piece of the deal because you brought a lot of cash up front to handle some of these immediate repair items. Tell me a little bit about the property. What was the occupancy when you guys bought it? What is it today? How are rents doing? So we, when we bought it, it was like 94%. And our idea was to uh, have interior upgrades. The good thing was, again, that a uh, good 80% of the flooring is already done. So our upgrades are not going to be all that expensive. And it's mostly fast upgrades, you know, like fixtures, uh, lighting fixtures and plumbing fixtures and appliances. But quite frankly, since we took over, first of all, we ended the month at 97 plus occupancy. And uh, we are doing better than Performa. And we have not started anything that tenants can really see yet. What I mean by that, we have not done the landscaping that we are going to do. We have not started the uh, exterior repaint that they are going to see. We have not started improving the courtyards that they're going to see. All that has not happened, and yet we are actually outperforming our Performa. You know, another tip I just came to mind that he was talking about. So a few years ago when we first started doing deals that – the lender has uh, a couple restrictions where you get constrained either on a value uh, standpoint, loan to value, or on a debt service constraint. And back a few years ago, everything was, uh, you know, you buy these deals at eight, eight and a quarter cap and borrow mm-hmm. money at 5%. So right. everything was really value constrained. So what the, the job was, uh, was for you to, the Fannie Mae product, at least back then, would have up to $5,000 a door and available CapEx. They would loan you 80% of that or 4000 a door up to. And so what you would do is put as much of the money within the lender, but the lender would hold that money and escrow back. And now with the cap rates compressing and everything coming a little bit tighter, more and more, most of these deals are getting debt service constrained, which I'm sure was probably your guys' case here. It was. talking about about loan proceeds uh, getting cut. So I think some of the tips are like, well, maybe I have a $5,000 door CapEx budget, but I'm getting debt service constrained. So the lender's not going to loan me that money anyway. So maybe I show the lender hey, here's half of that money. You can escrow half of the half. I'm going to self-escrow so I'm not subject to all these uh, lender inspections and draws because they're not going to give me the uh, proportionately more loan proceeds. So why have them hold that money for you? So there's a total budget and there's a lender budget. And sometimes you know the, we, we self-escrow part of it and have the lender have a part of it escrowed as well, depending on how we, we size on these deals. Sure. Because it doesn't make sense to me to give up control of your capital if there's not some sort of corresponding benefit by getting you know, additional loan proceeds. And I'm sure here you guys were mentioning when the treasury was going up at the end of last year, you were getting you know cut. You know Every time you turn around, it's probably bad news after bad news, uh, multiple days in a row. 70000 today, 80000 tomorrow. <laughs> Been there, done 90, that. So, so Sometimes it goes in your favor and sometimes it, it doesn't. So it sounds like you got it on the wrong side of that trade the end of last year. But that's just a little thing that popped into my mind on on these deals that we've been doing here recently when the, the debt service constraint is, is coming into play. No, absolutely. Let's jump over to your latest uh, acquisition of a property called Urbana. 
Tell us a little bit about that transaction. Sure. So this is uh, 204 units uh, in uh, San Antonio. For me, this is the first property I've ever bought in San Antonio. But the great thing is uh, about this is, by the way, that Brad Summerock is on our sponsorship team. So he was part of the sponsorship team, which was great. What does that bring to you? What does Brad's background bring to the deal? Oh, a lot. Honestly, as busy as he is, it's amazing how involved he was. He took the time to fly out there with me, spent the whole day before making his decision, and he gave us great tips on the rehab budget. He was helpful throughout. And I'll tell you also that obviously, you know, his ecosystem, everybody knows how phenomenal that is. But with him on the team and with his ecosystem, we were able to raise $4.2 million in two and a half days. Wow. So that was all because of obviously Brad and his and ecosystem. He, he doesn't do that and all the transactions that are in his group. So he, he does it every once in a while. And you were, I guess that property was good enough for that made the numbers work for Brad that he was able to co-sponsor the deal with you guys. Yeah. So well, obviously he hasn't done that with too many students, to be honest. And, you know, we were absolutely honored when he decided to uh, join the team. And I'm sure part of the reason was, again, I, I mentioned to you, you know, downside protection and underwriting conservatively. I would like to think that, you know, it was it was a great location. It was a great asset, but it also was the way underwriting was written that clicked with him when he saw the underwriting. Paint a picture for somebody who's never seen the property. What does it look like? How many doors? When was it built? All those good things. Got you. So again, this is uh, you know early 60s property, but it has been rehabbed that I've never seen anything else to be rehabbed. I mean, this uh, seller must have spent good $7,000 a unit. That's the kind of rehab he has done, interior only. And then the exterior, the property looks like uh, class B asset. The uh, location is uh, phenomenal. It is like three minutes drive from the airport, and it is right behind it. And when I say right behind, literally right behind the North Star Mall. We have only one street between us and the mall. So you just cross the street, you are into the uh, this uh, high-end North Star Mall. It's a great location, 204 units, so you know, great economy of scale. And uh, we're just so fortunate to get it. So tell me a little bit, what was the occupancy of the deal? And how did you guys actually get the deal? How was it presented to you? Did you guys go to a best and final? Tell me a little bit about the process. Sure. So honestly, before I got involved in Urbana deal, I thought Casa Feliz was the toughest deal. Yeah. And I learned that was not the case. Urbana, again, it uh, we signed the contract in October and we closed it in March. So it took a long time. How we got the deal it was quite competitive, frankly. And again, I am grateful to you, Paul. If you remember, you joined us on a conference call with the seller and you know you brought in Doherty on that call. And I think that tipped the balance in our favor. So how important is it on these best and final calls to have your lender involved with the discussion with the seller? Again, Mike and I have talked about it before about having everybody in on the call with the seller, listen to how strong the seller or buyer is in the deal. How important was it for you to have, have oh, the lender it, on the call? It was crucial. Uh-huh. It was absolutely crucial. As you know, at the end, it was we had one very high profile buyer against us. And to still be able to tip the balance in our favor, I have absolutely no doubt it was, you know, you guys helped us. You know, in, in making seller that decision in our favor. Absolutely. So it's absolutely crucial. The reason is, look, it is at the end of the day, it is about debt and equity, right? So the equity part belonging to the Brad Sumrock group, they knew, and with my track record, they knew I've always done, uh, closed the deal in time without any problems. And then you guys brought in the debt side. So for seller, it was, hey, they already have the equity part and they have such a close relationship on the uh, debt side. I think that's really what got us the deal. So tell me a little bit about, you know, after you guys were awarded the deal, you guys raised the money, how many investors were in that transaction and how many partners did you have in that deal? Because that was a fairly good size transaction, right? Yes. So initial raise, frankly, we estimated it to be $4.2 million. And again, part of that was me because I put in lower leverage than we ended up getting. Uh, mm-hmm. LTV, and I put it higher interest than we ended up getting. 
So we initially estimated that we'll need 4.2 million. At the end, actually, we needed only 4 million. So we had to return capital, but that 4.2 million was raised within two and a half days. So tell me, what are investors, passive investors, looking for for a return on their money? What are you seeing out there? Is it 6%, 4%, 5%? What are investors looking for to invest their money into this property? I think you have different types of investor, but I, I think as someone who, who's making acquisitions and running these projects, I think you have to clearly communicate as to what you can generate as opposed to necessarily what they want. Obviously, everybody would like to have, you know, double digit cash on cash. And that sometimes is not available, you know, yeah. in the current market conditions. If you can produce that at the end, phenomenal. But right now it, it's, it's tough to do. So to me, if you can generate around 8% cash on cash and total of 70 to 75%, you know, 14 to 15% we are talking about annual return. That's a phenomenal return. And again, let me go back to my Wall Street, right? You look at long-term S&P numbers, 7% at best. Yeah. Okay. So here you're looking at double of that. Yeah. Is and, that really an issue? And tax advantages too. Right. And tax advantages and low volatility. And so you said like the 8%, is that that's your average? So year one, year two is a little lower than hopefully year three, four, five is a little higher. Is that, is that accurate? Uh, that's a good point. So, Mike, yes, it's, it's not like every year, right, 8%. When you average out the five years, you know, it's 8 plus percent. So you walk in the door, you get five, six, year one, six, seven, year two, and then kind of year three forward, your 8 plus is kind of what you're projecting. And then when you sell it at the end of the day, you give, give us $1 uh, equity multiple of about a 175 turns into $1. seventy-five between the cash flow and the gain at the end. So you average all that together. Someone's going to get about 14 to 15% average annualized return or IRR uh, over that five-year period. That's basically what you, what you put together. That is correct. Now, in terms of cash on cash, sometimes your cash on cash upfront doesn't have to be low because you're getting uh, IO yeah. uh, upfront, right, for first two, three years. So it is not necessarily that your first year cash on cash is lower and then second year is better and third year is you know, better than that. Not necessarily, right, because you get IO. It depends on your IO. But overall, if you you know generate 8 to 9% cash on cash and total 14% return, Average five years, that's fantastic. And I'll put all my money, to be honest, uh, you know, being even somebody who's from Wall Street and who made, you know, all his money initially in Wall Street, I'll put in these kind of deals all day long. And that's what I'm doing. Yeah, I think that's good to kind of understand because a lot of people, um, especially a lot of people that listen to this are, are relatively new, but then there's a lot of people that have uh, invested deals seven, eight years ago that, uh, <laughs> you know, those days are gone. As, as Paul, as Paul, I think, mentioned on the last podcast we had, the, uh, Types of returns that uh, people need to kind of get recalibrated to are lower and holding them longer. And I think that's just generally kind of a function of where we are in the cycle in the marketplace. It's just, just the math doesn't work. Uh, being a math major, you understand the math doesn't work as well when you have to pay a pretty comparable cap rate to, uh, to your debt payment and your interest rate. So the, there's not quite the same arbitrage that, that was available. Uh, and it's just a relative thing to, to his credit. He's referring to kind of Wall Street. So when you're out there looking at money, just a big pool of money and is trying to find a place to go. Some of it's super safe and wants, you know, treasury bills or in a money market account. And some people want to put some brisk on their, on their capital and they, you know, kind of the traditional Wall Street investments or this is kind of the quote unquote alternative investment, which never quite makes sense to label an alternative investment because there's so much real estate everywhere and it's a need and people live in it. But, um, you know, I think those are some of the things that when you're trying to raise capital, you got to look at your counterparty and what their kind of the pressures are and what they're looking at. So he sells tax advantages. Sell stability, sells some, you know, yield along the way, and hopefully a pot of gold within the rainbow when they when they sell the deal a few years down the road. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's talk about the, in finishing Urbana. You said that, that the seller did a lot of work. What are you guys going to do on this property? How much rehab dollars, and where's that money going to go? So the rehab on that is is um, actually I should say IRL is is more trickier than other. There are certain items uh, in our IRL that I think we will be able to change the scope of again, and I think we'll have a reduced scope and therefore reduced budget. Having said that, we wanted to play safe and, you know, we wanted to raise enough money. We wanted to have enough cash buffer. So even under the absolute worst case scenario, we have a buffer. Even from the worst case scenario, we still have a buffer. Wow. But I feel that I think, again, hopefully, just like every other deal, here we will be able to do better on the IRL as well as the rehab. Our rehab here is not major, Paul. 
And uh, part of the reason is, like I said, you know, next time when you're around, visit the property and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Sure. I mean, property looks absolutely great. You know, interiors, like I said, I have never, ever seen anybody rehabbing interiors to that extent. And, you know, I've never seen anybody who rehabs 100% of the units, right? Generally, everybody leaves few for the next buyer. But in this case, uh, every unit of 204 units has been upgraded. Our play there is is more of uh, loss to lease, better management, and some rehab. So let's finish up this podcast. What? So if you're talking with Tahid Jr., what kind of advice are you telling people these days? Good to still stay in real estate? Multifamily still good? Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I think that, you know, the issue is not an asset class, uh-huh. right? The issue is not, a, this is one of the best asset class. This is this has the lowest volatility. It has most visibility. And I don't mean to be throwing you know, technical terms, but you know, if you look at like a sharp ratios concept, real estate has a phenomenal sharp ratio. If I were in, right now in Wall Street and I can promise you, you know, 8% stable return and with a chance of 14% total return, I could be raising billions of dollars. No problems, right? That's what real estate can do for you. Now, does this mean go buy everything at any price? No. So you got to be smart. You got to know what you're buying. You got to have a right business plan. You got to have right partners to help you. But you can make a mistake, but it's not the asset class, right? Asset class, I mean, go decades back in this country. It's one of the best country in the world. Real estate has done great. Yeah. Has there been cycles? Absolutely. But be prepared for it. Tell me about something that we have not talked about in this podcast that you would want to have, say, newbies or new people know. You've learned in multifamily. It's all about team. This this is a team sport. Yep. Okay. Pre-acquisition, at the acquisition time, and post-acquisition. So build your team. And when you build your team, don't just think of take, take, take. It's give and take. Yeah. So if you're partnering with somebody and you're fortunate enough to find a partner, and once that partner gave you the ability and chance to get your first deal, respect that, you know, be grateful and maintain your relationships with brokers, with lenders, with contractors. You're going to need that every day to be successful in this field. Right. Yeah. That's, I think, uh, another way of saying that is, is with the team, it's not always just like price, right? It's certainty of execution. It's uh, being able to rely on them. We're buying a deal now. And I had a few, few quotes from some lenders we haven't done business with, and we decided to take a bank that I've gone through multiple times and, you know, took a little lower in proceeds, but I felt really confident that the app's going to be what the settlement statement is going to show at the end of the day. Right. So I didn't want to be retraded in the, in the approval process and, and kind of a moving target. So yeah, I think on the lending really side thing. is I would say that people get, get captured by the siren song, you know, lower rates, higher proceeds. And you know, it's, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. So be very careful with the siren song. You want to go with a group that can have the certainty of execution, get it done. And the biggest thing is just like what Tahit says is stay, stand behind the deal after it closes because you may be only with me for 60 days and the origination of the, of the transaction, but you're going to be the lender for, you know, 10 years. Right, yeah. yeah. So you got to make sure that, that uh, you're dealing with a group that uh, when they, they asset manage the deal, that they're players with you. Yeah, too. and then Urbana is a good example where he uh, he took in too much money and had a good problem, had to either you know, have additional working capital or give it back. But you know if you have a, a lender that doesn't execute or do what they say they're going to do, that could be the opposite of that problem. And uh, he had been having to scramble at the last minute to pick up 200000 instead of giving it back. That's very possible. So if someone wanted to get to know you a little bit better, Tahid, what's the best email address that you have that someone can get a hold of you? Sure. And you know, one of the things we did, Paul, and you and I talked about it, uh, we launched our website. My 2019 plans included growing my organization, which I've already done. I've hired a director of operations and uh, also launched a website. It is T-A-A-S Investments. It's www.tossinvestments.com. And um, my email is uh, my first name with Q-S, so T-A-U-H-E-E-D-Q-S at, at tossinvestments.com. Or I'm always available through the phone, which is 972-273-0303. Sounds great, Tahid. I love the story. Keep going. Go to your next next transaction. Love to see that. Mr. Michael Becker. Always a pleasure. Hey, thanks. Two, two in a row. It's good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and your you. own podcast. Three in a row, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. That's good. 
All right. Tahid, thanks for coming in. Michael Becker, thank you. I'm Paul Peebles. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at oldcapitalpodcast.com to sign up for our weekly email updates. We'll see you next week for another great interview.